the Hedgeless Horseman here. It's April the 2nd, 2023. Uh, I haven't done a video in uh, a few days or maybe even a week. Yeah, I've been very busy lately, um, so you'll have to forgive me. I've seen some people on Twitter uh, wanting to uh, have some copium uh, videos, and, and I guess this might be a uh, copium video uh, well i guess it at least can act like it i mean i'm just gonna mostly go through where i think commodities to me is by far the most no-brainer asset class uh, that i can see now and i i would assume that it's probably the biggest layup in commodities uh, in many many decades if if i just had to guess uh, so yes, let's go over some slides uh, that I think kind of proves the point. I mean, here first of all you have gold production uh, of uh, four very large gold miners, and uh, you can see it goes back for Kinross. It's at 2015 start. Barrick starts 2006, 2004 for Anglo Gold Ashanti, 2005 for gold fields. Uh, this is obviously also highlighting why I personally don't like uh, large miners. I don't see the point in uh, investing in large miners really because it's pretty much only beta. Because if it was so easy to keep up production or grow, uh, you wouldn't see declines like this in production. It just becomes, I mean, it's like, the, let's say, the new Crest and new Monte Merger. Uh, let's say they go ahead and merge. Obviously, the new entity would be even larger, which means it's going to be even harder for them to just stand still in the future. And to double the production or double the growth or whatever, or ex I mean, double the production and or double the mine life, uh, of that company, I mean, it's it's just get extremely hard. I mean, imagine I don't know what the exact uh, gold equivalent production uh, would be, uh, but let's say it's close to ten million ounces or eight million or whatever. I, I I'm not hundred percent sure, but it's like yeah, that's kind of hard to find mines big enough to move the needle at least anytime soon and then also you know to extend I mean if you would produce 8 million ounces per year and you would need uh, or you would like to double the mine life from from 10 to 20 years or whatever or 20 to 30 years 10 years of 8 million ounces that's obviously 80 million ounces that's not that easy uh, it's like, you know, Quinton has said, uh, mining is all about, you know, fighting against entropy, basically. Because as soon as you put a mine into production, the value has peaked and it just goes down from there. So I, I'd rather be in the ones that start off small, I mean the juniors. Uh, first of all, because it's easier for them to double in value. Much easier, obviously. It's a lot, again, easier to... Go from 200,000 ounces to 400,000 ounces or from 200,000 ounces to a million ounces or a million to two million than going from doubling the production of barrick or whatever. I mean, that, that that's just, you know, might take a decade, who knows? Uh, and I don't count mergers and acquisitions because it's just, a, it's not actually a doubling of what... Uh, of value, it's just basically combining value and then trying to get some synergies, etc. etc. And sure, if they buy something undervalued, uh, the acquirer obviously creates some value, but it's it's not like anywhere close to the pace where a junior could uh, produce value. And, and second of all, I mean, how cheap are the majors? Are they cheap? Yeah, I would guess they're cheap. But I, I mean, the mining business is lousy. The actual mining business is lousy, typically. So, I mean, if you're not growing, you're you're declining. I mean, you're slowly dying. That's it. So, I want to be in the... Uh, all companies need to have growth. 
and if they're cheap like the actual juniors are right now because again i don't know if the majors are really that cheap sure are they gonna go up with if gold goes to two thousand five hundred or three thousand uh, dollars anytime soon would the majors go up a lot yeah maybe they can go up you know i don't know 100 to 200 percent or maybe even more but like the juniors would especially since they're starting off so cheap they could absolutely explode i mean if, if gold went to 2500 or 3000 i mean you would probably have some of these beta play juniors they'll, they'll 10 bag or something like that uh that's the you know funny part without doing anything they could easily 10 bag simply because of flow of funds and sentiment and etc uh but i i personally don't like pure beta plays that much because if if you're wrong on timing and timing is extremely hard uh, it could be very frustrating i always feel very dumb after uh let's say i i own some beta it goes up and then it retraces uh i immediately feel stupid it's like because honestly yeah it went up in price and who knows maybe it was still kind of cheap but at the same time if it's a trading sardine it's typically not really the valuable to begin with hence why it's a trading sardine hence why like you know bear creek mining has been around for 10 20 years with its deposit and nobody's really wanted to put that into production M might that change in the future of course but it's not it's not like a tier 2 tier 1 asset it's huge but it's not it has a lot of problems etc uh, so in that case, I mean, who knows what the actual value is? I mean, if we knew, we know in hindsight that 10 years ago, Bear Creek Mining was probably not worth a lot because, I mean, uh, that project, at least, or big silver projects, is pretty much no closer to production than 10 years ago. So if you just discounted the cash flow, etc., and you would say that, hey, this is at least not going to be a mine within 20 years, I mean, the value of that mine 10 years ago would be kind of low, obviously. Anyway, uh, let's go uh, move on. T top 10 gold miners average grade for existing gold reserves. Uh, declining, as you can see, uh, over the last, uh, what's that, like 18 years. Uh, not down to half yet, but yes, steady decline. So not only are they producing less, I mean, that's the funny part. Okay, if they produce this much back in 2005 for 2006 and then you have you know the grades declining as well i mean that's just yeah that kind of highlights how how much harder it is right now in the sector and how hard it is to find new uh, great projects and i mean i just thinking about for example snow line um, appears to have a huge deposited valley uh, good quite good grades especially for an open pit good metallurgy etc i mean th those are not uh, common at all so i can understand why b2 gold thinks that hey if we can pick up a yes it's very remote etc many years from production but if we can pick up a good grade high margin large gold deposit in canada maybe that's a very good bet in the future because it's like obviously it's hard to find those nowadays and canada is just you know appears to be increasing in, in jurisdictional value uh, but also one point to that, that that's why i like for example uh you know grassroots exploration stuff and i've talked uh, you know to people at pdac about that and i talked to like the guys from uh, headwater and inflection uh who who you know many have made the point that there's a lot of projects going around that typically are just projects that didn't work 10 years ago but now you know and junior is gonna try to market that and make it work uh, but i mean the the mines that the old timers mined or the mines back that were mined back here etc i mean obviously they it's possible to find those mines or at least was at some point it's not like they magically disappears uh, with time uh, it's harder to find them especially if they're you know obvious if there's outcropped surface and obviously you would pluck out the eyes of yada yada and that's why like i wrote in the headwater gold piece about uh, 
uh, you know, they, they're trying to find low sulfidation systems uh, in the U.S. Uh, that has not had the high-grade ice plucked out. I mean, I, I, I heard about, uh, you know, how valuable the Midas mine was, for example. Um, and uh, Headwater has the Midas North uh, project, which is immediately north to the... Uh, historic Midas gold mine and um, that was basically like an SK Creek type deposit for I don't know if it was Maybe it was Barrick who owned it some large company at least it, it kind of saved their bacon like SK Creek did for uh, Whatever junior that owned that which acquired homestake uh, point is that if you find one of these Let's say to uh, Deposits or targets or deposits that would work well 20 years ago or more uh, way even farther back than that it's Like the only way to find them is to f Do grassroots expression because like I, I talked to Alistair off uh, Headwater gold where he said like or no, it was Caleb uh, Caleb the CEO who said like yeah, I mean there are no high-grade low sulfidation systems around in the US because all were mined those deposits are so good that regardless almost what the gold price is they get mined that's why there are no, none of those around and most of the exploration nowadays is you know uh, again like uh, uh, revisiting those systems but like the, the high-grade core of those systems they were mined decades and decades ago but to find one of those intact ones today, I mean, that would be pretty special because if they worked like 25 or 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, you find one of those today intact with the high grade core intact, obviously that's going to be worth, worth something. So it's like finding um, today when mining is getting, you know, the deposit quality is getting lower and lower and grade lower and lower to find one of the ones that made a lot of money way back, you know, 50 years ago or 100 years ago. That is very exciting to me. And uh, like I talked to, what company was it? Uh, 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 maybe it was, uh, uh, I think, yeah, Aztec Minerals uh, talked to their CEO. It's like some of these, again, high quality, high grade, targets uh, high-grade deposit like low sulfidation systems 500,000 ounces of that stuff could be worth more than multiple million ounces of other stuff but we forget about that because again we as retail don't really focus on economics and I talked to some other industry veteran uh, well no it was actually Quinton who made that argument in his latest Crescat presentation that Everybody just cares about ounces. How many ounces? How big is it? Whereas, I mean, obviously, if you were a owner of a mining company or are a mining company, uh, the ounces would only be valuable if, if you made a profit on them. Uh, but that's not typical, especially in this day and age where are, there are not many great deposits that make a lot of money. The ones who are found, they typically get acquired. So we, in the junior space, we, we tend to be looking at a bunch of, you know, tier three, tier four projects or, or whatever that maybe never going to make much money or never made much money, yada, yada, yada. Uh, so we're not used to really looking for or thinking about economics, the actual value of the ounces, etc. And we forget, I forget, that it's like, hey, if you find 500,000 uh, ounces to 1 million ounces of high-grade gold or copper or whatever, it's like high-grade stuff, high-margin stuff, that's the key, high-margin stuff, uh, I mean, the value per ounce basis might be, you know, $600 per ounce. Whereas you have crap out there that's trading at $10 per ounce, and maybe that's a fair assessment of the value per ounce so i mean think about that Let, let's say it's uh, well let's say one type of ounce is worth six hundred dollars like legit six hundred dollars value and another one is worth 60 which is kind uh, you know a, a lot still but it's like that's 10 more va 10 times more valuable so 100 ounces of the 600 
dollar per ounce stuff is worth one million ounces of the sixty dollars per ounce stuff. So I mean, imagine the kind of leverage you can get if you, if you have, you know, uh, or early, let's say, in a discovery story or whatever, and, and it's like they they have a or have a shot at finding one of these, you know, very high margin uh, de deposit types. It's like it's going to take a long time for the retail market to pick that up because everybody's going to uh, typically be looking at okay, how many ounces do they have, not the actual value of what they found or are finding or are drilling etc because there's companies out there that can drill up m multiple million ounces but maybe the grades like 0.4 or whatever and the mines are absolutely worthless anyway uh, enough rant about that uh, i'm just gonna let's say do an overall run through like why again commodities this is the five-year lme nickel warehouse stock level uh, yeah, at five-year lows, uh, I'm assuming it wasn't down here. So uh, before that, uh, so I, I think the LME nickel warehouse stock level is probably the lowest in. Well, we know at least five years, but it's probably closer to I don't know twenty years something. I remember reading an article where the combined inventories at LME were at twenty-five-year lows not too long ago. So maybe it's you know the lowest ever or lowest in 25 years or whenever uh, LME started to have nickel. And I don't know if you've seen this in the Magna Mining Room, for example, or maybe from me retweeting. I mean, there's nickel deals flying all over the place and comments about, yeah, lithium and nickel are the, you know, uh, uh, the biggest headache for car companies, etc. And we know there's a bunch of gigafactories that are being built in in the US and they don't really have secured uh, uh, you know the, the metals uh, yet so it's like it, it seems they're kind of building out the battery production capacity uh, while there's you know already hard to source the supply <laughs> obviously that's good for uh, assuming it's like the economy doesn't totally crash etc and we just have a steady state uh, increased demand in EVs, yada yada, where nickel and lithium, etc. Copper just goes up. I mean, it's just a no-brainer. I mean, how, how many, especially nickel, I mean, how many nickel deposits are found? Or, yeah, how many nickel discoveries are made in North America, uh, primarily? I, I don't know if I remember. I mean, tail on metals, for example. I mean, there are, I think there are, I wouldn't say maybe grassroots, but yeah, they have exploration potential. It was like, hello, mag Magna Mining. I mean, can it get more ridiculous? It's like, it's like the government's uh, m uh, major miners, because we saw Vailu recently take a stab trying to acquire some Aussie nickel producer, I think. Uh, and that's uh, Vailu is uh, uh, Andrew Forrester's uh, nickel place, a billionaire. In, in Australia. Uh, so it's like you see governments, Pentagon, etc., handing out grants, talking about critical supply. I mean, it, it's literally that, you know, the military is getting involved because it's so critical. And you have the mining companies, they see this as well. So they're trying to acquire nickel assets and try to look for nickel. And you have the, the uh, core companies talking to pretty much, I would assume, every nickel company. And you had, uh, I think it was Anglo Gold who bought the. Uh, of take agreement on some uh, big low grade deposit here in Canada, which kind of suggests that yes, to have the rights to to take ownership of the produced nickel, it, it's I mean they're front running. I think that that's going to go up in value when when the battery makers or car companies are gone. It's like yeah, they need to supply supply that nickel. They they need maybe there won't be any uh, you know enough nickel. So if you have rights to the supply from a mine it's like that yeah then you're set you basically made sure that you can keep producing uh, nickel otherwise it's like hey you don't have nickel i'm sorry it's like you can't even make a battery or make a car so it's like yeah again neon signs out there and still these uh, i mean there's not too many nickel units around because it's so hard to find nickel etc so. but like i don't think magna mining has any business trading this cheap i mean it's just redonkulous uh 
you know two semi-permanent projects in Sudbury of all places it's, it's just yeah it's 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 truly mind-blowing it's like in my opinion uh, I, I think Magna for sure has five to ten X potential uh, it, especially you know that given the trends we're seeing right now I mean if if there was a ton more nickel coming online or we hit a big depression nobody wanted nickel whatever yeah things can happen but as things stand right now and where the nickel price is not right now i think magna mine is just absurdly undervalued so that takes care of my nickel exposure because as i'll uh, get to later i mean i i think it's i, I don't want to be uh, risk being completely wrong. I would prefer to be somewhat right and completely wrong. Meaning that, okay, if I'm only in gold, well, well, gold is, might be a bad example because that I, I think I mean gold is basically been in a bull market for five thousand years. Uh, but it's like, yeah, okay, let's say something happens and gold takes a two-year hiatus hiatus or something. Yeah, okay, that's kind of you know kind of suck and maybe the ev battery metals just zoom through the roof because in i don't know how they would do it but let's say the powers that be uh, are able to save the world economy and it's like yeah we won't go into a recession or they speed up the ev transition even more whatever whatever so it's like yeah you have nickel lithium and, and copper just zooming uh, given that, as you see here, I mean, critical supply levels. Here you have copper warehouse levels. Here you have, well, this is zinc. Uh, so it's not like the typical EV metal, I guess. But it's like, yeah, they're all at five-year lows, pretty much. Uh, so I, I don't want to turn a blind eye to that because I, I, you know, love gold and think gold juniors are cheap. No, I, I wouldn't mind having, you know, a dirt cheap nickel junior. Let's say nickel uh, goes up because you know the global growth keeps the same pace that it's doing now or, or whatever demand for ev batteries go up yada yada even harder to get supply whatever it's like yeah okay th then maybe you know my nickel position which is pr primarily magna mining maybe that goes up two three times over the next uh, 12 to 24 months so what if gold goes down in that case? Okay, then I can just reshuffle when, let's say, Magna Mining isn't dirt cheap anymore or we're close to some nickel top or something. Then I could reshuffle into gold. Maybe catch that next leg. So I like the idea of uh, using a shotgun approach since th the primary reason why I own anything is because I think it's cheap. I think Magna is super cheap and it gives me diversification. Um... Here we have a slide about copper. Okay, copper mines are struggling in Chile. Uh, it was Robert Friedland who posted this. Uh, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's like, yeah, okay, declining. So you have declining inventories, uh, you have declining copper production from Chile, which I think is the largest producer. Well, that's great going into, you know, uh, electrification boom and EV boom and yada yada. So wh why, why, won't, why wouldn't you love copper? Why wouldn't you love copper in, in the face of this? Can things change in the future? Sure, but it's not probably going to change anytime soon, really. Obviously, we have the, you know, the, the mother short of everything. Uh, S&P Commodity Index versus S&P 500. It's like... Uh, I, I know somebody... Well, I've seen some, let's say... Uh, I don't know, bashing or negative takes on this. It's like, who cares? I mean... It's like goes back to 1970. Uh, it, it's easy to just draw uh, some kind of lines here. I mean, you have uh, have the ratios here. I mean, it's it's obvious that it swings big time, and and people uh, people might you know oh it didn't bottom here it actually went lower so that means it doesn't work or it has not yet tur yet turned up. I was like, yeah, but look at look at the supply charts. Look at the production charts. Here's also one, global mining under investing growth, which is going to mean that there's going to be less copper, nickel, gold, whatever found uh, because uh, they're not looking for it. Or, or let's say in growth, they're under investing in growth. What does that mean? I mean, less supply. I watched one presentation by, I don't remember his name. 
but it was a very good presentation where uh, there was a report out that argued that uh, the mining space as a whole is underinvesting by 90% uh, if they were to meet the you know set goals of how many electric cars etc we, we should have by 2035 or something like 90% underinvestment so it's like yeah why shouldn't you love this shard uh, it won't make sense and we're just fortunate enough that the future potential supply, which are the juniors, they're pricing in that there's going to be a supply glut. They are cheap. Copper juniors are cheap. Nickel juniors are cheap. Gold juniors are cheap. I think even silver juniors juniors are cheap. So what are, what's that pricing in? They're pricing in that what they have and could potentially put into production uh, isn't worth much in, according to the market which would either every product is shit which doesn't make much sense because how uh, if every product is shit and are not expected to get into production the supply picture would get even worse so the value of the commodities would go up even more so the shit products would suddenly work so it's it's like a you know a, a a loop it doesn't make sense because you can't have it both ways oh no we're, n none of these projects are mining worthy okay let's say that's true so there won't be any real supply so it should then price in a supply shortage but they are not so it's like it doesn't make sense i mean it just doesn't add up at all uh yeah and it's like who knows? I don't know if you're going to reach the tops or whatever. But everything fits, I would say. Yeah, I, I think commodities are undervalued. Because when you see governments talking about it, Pentagon talking about it, large, uh, the large companies who, who need to source and secure critical minerals, when they're out and about all the time, yeah, they're, we have a problem. I mean, they know more than us. They know more than us retail. But it's us retail that are setting the prices of these commodities in the ground and i think i mean uh, we, we retail right now are batshit crazy we have no idea what we're doing we uh, th they're simply too lowly valued and, and that's yeah basically how i see it i mean i did this for a twitter post but anyway uh that's how i see it like i, I think m many of the above quality juniors maybe they have a fair value up here whatever they're like dirt cheap or uh, here or whatever it's like when people say you know what's margin of safety what is risk i mean ob obviously volatility is not risk i mean margin of safety means that uh it's worth more than you're paying for it sooner or later that's going to get reflected okay that doesn't mean it can swing huge in the meantime We've seen some of the best success stories swing by minus 50% during the COVID crash or whatever, whatever. So volatility is not risk. It's like if you have a, if, if you have on a one target junior, they're really one target. That's the only target they have. That's the only project they have and they miss. Then you have a problem because it might go down 50, 60%. And unless something changes, it has no business going up again. Why? One second. It has no, no business going up. Why? Because they have nothing of value. But if you have a company like I remember when AI, A, A, I-80 Gold... Uh, hit those uh, nice discovery holes, etc. And just kept hitting, hitting and hitting, making discoveries. Price went down 50%. It's just ridiculous. So margin of safety it, ha it had, or uh, uh, big time, I think they have. I mean, I think they're going to have closer to, I don't know, 12, 12 million ounces of gold or 14 or whatever. Uh, and that's probably going to grow and they have a CRD discovery. That didn't stop price from going down 50%. The thing is that it was so obviously undervalued based on what they had, that it was a matter of time before it went up, assuming they don't go bankrupt or whatever. 
Uh, that's a completely different picture. Something going down 50% that shouldn't go down 50% and all of a sudden having a margin of safety, which means that, yes, this is high, very high prob probability it's going to go up because what they have is worth a lot more than the price. But if you have one target miss on the target, so the target becomes worthless pretty much, then you have nothing. There's no margin of safety. If, if it goes down 50%, 60%, it probably should stay down there until something happens. Um, this is just, in my opinion, a very funny things like my Sa Michael Saylor, the robots will only take Bitcoin. So it's like, yeah, the natural question. What are these robots manufactured from? Metals. What are they powered by? Energy. Copper wiring. It's like, I don't remember a single... I mean, think about every sci-fi movie or whatever. It's like, okay, The Matrix, for example. Yeah, they... Uh, what was scarce in that universe? Well, energy became scarce. So they started use, uh, harvesting, you know, uh, growing and harvesting humans for electricity. That's one could say a commodity. I mean, Bitcoin, what does it do? It, it doesn't really... Do I mean it, it keeps track of itself and consumes a lot of electricity? What would a robot do with it? Like, let's say you have a uh, you know two robot populations, uh, two different islands. One has all the metals in the world and the energy, or has a lot of energy and metals. The other one has all the bitcoins. Who would be setting the rules in that scenario? Would they trade a single coin, uh, silver coin for a Bitcoin? I don't think so. I mean, it's an extreme example, but it's like, yeah, what is actually, cri what is actually critical? If, if there was no pr copper production coming on, uh, or if all copper, copper production stopped today, uh, civilization would totally be, well, in deep shit. If Bitcoin went to zero today, well, there would be some margin calls, etc. But it's like, yeah, that, that's that's paper paper money that went up in smoke. But it would not be like some catastrophe to civilization. But Bitcoin has been around for 13 years. Civilization was uh, uh, was around before that, or 14 years, or 15 years, or whatever. It's like, yeah, we we did fine before Bitcoin. We will do fine without Bitcoin. We won't do fine without copper, nickel, zinc, lead, steel, silver, gold, lumber, energy, oil, gas, whatever. It's like, it's, it's such, it's, it's so stupid. I mean, I, I, I personally, I, I have no idea how you could be aware of the commodity sector. I'm not saying he is very much aware of the commodity sector, energy, whatever, but like, if you are aware of the commodity sector and miners, you have some kind of uh, you know, some kind of knowledge. I have no idea how anybody could think that the, the risk reward in Bitcoin would be worth selling a single share of, uh, of a mining company or, or especially physical, whatever. Sure, if you want to dabble in Bitcoin and put, I don't know, you know, a percent or whatever, it's like for fun, if nothing else. That I can understand. It's like I have no idea where Bitcoin is going to go. But it's like the risk reward is does not come even close to commodities for for I w what I would say obvious reasons, and those reasons are just becoming more and more obvious by the day. Uh, so it's like this doesn't even make sense. But he's I mean all the due diligence from this guy lately, uh, or most of it that I've seen, it's like you know just tweeting inspirational pictures that you know basically goes against the point he's trying to make uh, Robert Friedland tweeted this global copper stockpiles will deplete by August if the present trend continues visible inventories uh, th this is yeah, uh, from Financial Times okay current demand if this keeps up will be out by I guess this is August and Goldman Sachs forecast is that it, you know, uh, will run dry. Not only LME, but all visible inventories by year end. 
yeah, imagine that. Critical metal and, you, you know, all the stockpiles are down. Where, where's copper going to go in that case? Supply-demand curve. Have to rise demand, get somebody to uh, say no to their portion of the supply, to the one that bids even higher, etc., etc. Just absolute no-brainer. I like copper as well, uh, especially since... It's not that dependent on the EV revolution. We're going to need more copper for, uh, you know, the electricity grid. I mean, just the solar panels and everything, basically. And, and there's like 1.3 billion Indians and, and all of that that are, want to have electricity, yada, yada, yada. So I guess copper is the most obvious long-term play uh, of them all outside of, I mean... To get with gold, I would guess, because like gold has never lost a battle for five thousand years, and uh, it always ends up in a bull market. Uh, OPEC surprise one million barrel oil production cut. Uh, th that's also a funny thing. It's like yeah, okay, prices are too low, so they're gonna g they're gonna cut production. Okay, that that might be not be a good sign for. The global economy, obviously, that there's not enough oil demand. And the funny thing is that, okay, you, you don't really see that in the m critical metals. It's not like, yeah, nickel is so cheap that, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, the market is oversaturated with nickel. There's just too much nickel and they need to, you know, stop the mines. No, that's pretty much the opposite um, right now, uh, which kind of, yeah, I mean, I, I don't hate oil, especially now, obviously, if they're going to cut one million barrels. Uh, but it's like, yeah, there, there's, in their opinion, too much supply, not enough demand. So they're going to cut supply. You don't have that problem really in the metals right now. It's more the opposite. I mean, comic silver is getting drained. Comics gold is getting drained. The LME inventories of copper, zinc, nickel, whatever, they're like at five-year lows. Uh, which suggests that prices are too low. There's too much demand. Um, and on that point, well, kind of that point. I mean, th this is natural gas futures. I know some people, and it's like, th this was around, you know, uh, when e the shit hit the fan in Europe. And everybody was expecting uh, prices to go up. I, in my, myself included, I was like, oh shit, this is going to be the worst winter ever. You heard about the electricity bills and there's going to be rationing, whatever, whatever. It's like, yeah, the, the funny thing about markets and humanity, we have a th way to figure things out. So that was very telegraphed, obviously. Everybody was talking about the need to get more natural gas. So they fixed that. I mean, they rerouted a bunch of gas LNG carrying ships etc to Europe that would go to somewhere else and all of a sudden there's like a glut of gas I mean it's just redonkulous I mean they, they I think they call the natural gas the widow maker because it's like so extremely volatile but okay I didn't own natural gas here it's like uh, I don't know if it's gonna go up or down but it's like yeah everybody's onto this LNG trade natural gas although me, mining Twitter was talking about uh, well twitter overall i guess was talking about natural gas i don't i didn't feel too comfortable now though problem now is that i don't know many i don't know much about the natural gas space so it's not winning my circle of confidence i don't know what junior let's say junior gas players etc are actually good that's a big problem i don't want to be buying shit and let's say it takes a while for gas prices to turn around and then you know you you know why some junior was trading very cheaply because management is shit they're gonna rob everyone or whatever i don't know that but it's like just from a game theory perspective let's say i mean this goes back to 97 this is a, i mean this is one of those no-brainers it's like the bear creek mining chart uh, which i use as a proxy I mean, just think about that going back for, you know, over 20 years. Whenever it reached this point, if you gave it, I don't know, a year, I guess, it was always higher within a year. Always higher within a year. It was like, if we just lowball, okay, what 
price has it at least reached since you know uh, uh, last 20 years i mean at least i guess uh, even going back here this level so that's still i mean might not look much but look like much but that's like that's like a 70 percent uh return in natural gas but of course if if you do like most people have done recently they try to bottom pick this and they use leverage which is kind of that's why i don't use leverage at all especially in the yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't use leverage at all. I don't want to be, I want to be right on the eventual direction. I don't want to need to be right on the timing as well. Because if you start buying here, and you get leverage, etc., and given how le leverage works, if it's zigzags, etc., you're gonna get, uh, you know, the decay and all of that. So you're probably gonna lose money. But if, if I, if I picked up, uh diversified portfolio of the best natural gas juniors i would be shocked if i w w uh, weren't sitting on a profit in them in within one two years and if that profit was maybe 100 to 200 percent even though most people would s make it, that would sound boring to most people that is way 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 better than almost anybody can average in the market The broader market average is 8-9% per year. Most people, active participants, cannot beat that. If, if you could average 100% over two years, you would be a king. If you could keep that up. Uh, again, problem with me, I don't know much about natural gas companies. I don't know if they're cheap. I mean, th there might be a scenario where like, yeah, the natural gas units, they're actually pricing in this kind of, I'm not saying they are, but like, yeah, if you don't know what they should be worth, etc., uh, maybe they're pricing in $4.8 per whatever it is. So it's like, yeah, you buy this because you're like, oh, natural gas. I mean, it's obviously cheap. If we go back historically, it doesn't stay down here for long. And it's like typically at least going to go up 70%. Maybe even up to, I mean, peaks, we're talking several hundreds of percent. But if it's if I buy a natural gas junior just based on that, just because I'm bullish on the eventual prices of natural gas and if it's already trading like natural gas is here because of a speculative premium or whatever that yeah there's too many trying to bottom pick or or they're bullish on natural gas whatever then i don't really have any margin of safety because then, then i'm actually overpaying for it so even, even if natural gas prices go back here uh you know then they it's valued at the same price I bought it for. So in that scenario, if theoretically I shouldn't be making any money at all, just be even Steven. Uh, so in this case, when you don't know much about the companies, I would uh, be more keen to take an unlevered bet. And again, it's like, yeah, I've seen, I saw some guy comment when I, on a post I did about LNG, and it's like, yeah, I, I, mean, I might be a bit early, but it's like, it doesn't really matter. I, I see that stuff all the time. It's like, let's see you, you bought here unlevered natural gas whatever or a cheap natural gas company and and i mean unless you literally bottom tick you're gonna be down you are going to uh, have quote overpaid because the chances of you picking anything up in a downtrend on the exact bottoming day are basically slim to none so it's like not even worth trying so the worst case in that in this scenario is like okay this was end of december yeah, okay, six months, which is an eternity for most people, I know. But okay, the worst thing, basically, and that's what I, w w my point has been about Bear Creek Mining, etc. If they're cheap, if they're extremely cheap, they're extremely cheap. The worst thing that could happen is that they become even cheaper for a while. Even cheaper for a while. So let's say it takes this, this path down here and then it goes up that much. Obviously, you would be very happy at this point that you bought it here. And if you're, again, a common sense person who's like, oh, if I know it's no-brainer cheap here, it goes down, oh, I can just buy it even more. Maybe you lowered your average 
to here after buying for six months, then you're going to make even more money. So is this a problem or not? Yeah, it's a problem if you need instant gratification and you can't, you know, you don't have the conviction or you think that, hey, the market is saying I'm stupid for six months and I believe it. So I start thinking that I'm stupid. So I'm going to sell out like uh, uh, every other jerk off. Uh, yeah, then you have a problem or you created a problem for yourself. Otherwise, it's just an opportunity. The opportunity is getting better. It's not a curse. It's getting better. It's like with these dirt cheap gold, nickel, juniors, whatever. It's like, if you know they're cheap and they go lower, yeah, you, you're going to sit at a paper loss. But if you can do something with it, if you have some dry powder or you can sell something else that's not as cheap, you just created future money. Thanks to Mr. Market being a dipshit, just getting absolutely more retarded, getting cheaper and cheaper. So it's like, 95% it's, of people would say it's a curse. The ones who understand and have some common sense, that's like, yeah, don't, you can't pick the ex absolute bottom, but the lower it goes, the more I'm going to make from that low. In that case, it's a blessing. Because you would make more. Um, obviously, from here, if you were able to lower your average fr uh, and it went down after you started buying, if your average is here, you're going to make more money and in a shorter time frame than if if you only bought here. Closer to the eventual bottom, inevitable bottom, higher returns. And I've, I've shown that in, I think, Bear Creek Mining, etc. a bunch of times. It's like, no bear trend lasts forever. No bull trend lasts forever. The longer something has gone down, if it goes down the next day, that's one day closer to the eventual up. Uh, uh, up leg so that means lower prices higher returns in a shorter time period that's why I keep saying it's like, or I kept saying it's like you just buy the lower it goes if it's dirt cheap it goes low you just buy 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 because every additional buy is going to have a quicker and higher payoff um, unlike natural gas okay here we have gold uh did it close at 1969? Okay, maybe it did. I thought it was close to the highest monthly. Uh, I, don't, I don't know where gold is going to go in the short term, okay? I have absolutely no idea. And obviously, it's not like in the case of natural gas, where it's like, yeah, it's the lowest point in you know years. Uh, yeah, years, basically. That it is not. However, gold juniors are absolutely dirt cheap. They are maybe pricing in a gold price of... Let's say 1500 or something, depending on the quality of the product. That is the margin of safety as I see it. If you buy a dirt cheap gold unit right now, anybody buys a dirt cheap gold unit and gold doesn't break out, 95 plus percent of people are going to say, ha ha, what an idiot, you bought, uh, you bought gold units. I knew it, gold was going to retrace. But technically, that it, you didn't make a mistake. Because it could go down to 1500 and you still wouldn't have been making a mistake, technically, because you didn't overpay. Now you're underpaying by a mile because gold is up here and they're pricing in that the gold price is down here. The juniors are pricing in that there's going to be a supply glut or a, that the sector is absolutely dog shit right now, which, is, which it isn't. I mean, it's not helpful if the OPEC countries make oil go up, so the producers uh, have a harder time. But still, most juniors are not even... I mean, they're a decade from production. So who cares what oil price was today? Anyway, that, that's the only... In, in the minds of a value investor. If you're a market timer or whatever, you have no idea what you're doing. Yeah, if this is the top, you're probably, you probably bought last week and you're going to sell first correction. I remember how many... I mean, there were so many bearish shorts here. When it broke down below here. And like my point back then was, I don't care, they're so cheap, I can't possibly sell. And people are still debating if it's a bull or a bear, etc. I mean, people will, when it's obvious it's a bull, and when would that be? That would be like, I don't know, this people might uh, thought have been a you know false breakout. That, oh, okay, yeah, but it retraced here, you have this candle, it's probably going to go down. Oh, then it went up, oh, and then all of a sudden, 
Ja, big fat bearish engulfing candle and people like, oh geez, this was actually all of a fa fake breaker, whatever, and there's sell out here. It's probably not until, I don't know. I mean, here everybody's convinced it's a bull, obviously. But that's the funny part. It's like, when everybody is convinced about, yeah, we're actually in a bull, uh, that's when the bear is right around the corner. It's like, people are still debating if this is a bull or not. Uh, but it's like, in the meantime, gold is up $300. And if you're not a market time, you just buy cheap, you bought this low. Because, you know, eventually, I mean, it's going to break out. Or at least the, the juniors are too cheap to begin with. Uh, so this was my conclusion. It's like, load up and load up some more until the juniors become expensive again. Maybe we can have... Yeah, okay, here's Bear Creek Mining. I mean, this I've shown this a bunch of times. Again, I don't own Bear Creek Mining. Well, I, I, I bought a bit here, actually, and sold it after, like, 20% plus. I mean, I'll take it. Tiny position. Uh, so this is mm, just a proxy, obviously. Uh, but this is basically... I mean, it's like uh, one version of the LMG trades. Like, I, I don't know how high or high, high low, how low it's going to go. Uh, this low was a bit lower than this. This low was a bit lower than that. Uh, but the swings are absolutely huge. So if you're even in the ballpark, I think I, I mean, just did a line like this sometimes. Like if you started buying at this line or below, I mean, you could buy up here, but as long as you bought more. But if you just start buying down here, uh, over the last 17 years, you would be up 100% within two years. From this point, if you bought more, you would be up more and in a quicker time frame. And that's why Pierre Lassonde calls this the easiest sector in the world. Uh, but it's funny, it's like, it is. But at the same time, nobody makes money in it. Which means that Lassonde is doing something or thinking about this in a way that almost nobody else does because it, to him it's the most the easiest sector in the world if you just have a look at this graph and just think about what just i just said yeah it would suggest it's the easiest sector in the world for the last 17 years if you started buying here you would, you would be up 100 percent within two years if you bought even if it went lower you bought it and you bought even more you would be up even more than 100% and in a shorter time period if you if you bought if you start buying here bought it all the way down then you would be up let's say you have an average down here 270% instead of well okay 100% is actually up here even so th th this is even higher uh, which is again kind of crazy. It's like m m this is what 2015. Uh, yeah, it's like a year. You had a a whole year. I mean, this at least. I mean, this was just a increase uh, buy zone or buying opportunity just went exponential. Again, I'm not talking about Bear Creek specifically, but this is, I think, a pretty good proxy for all juniors, even including the higher uh, higher quality ones. Same thing here. I had no idea. And I said, I have no idea when this is going to bottom. I just know this is absolutely dirt cheap. And I mean, within a few years, I'm going to be up a lot from this level. And we're here. And I think that's kind of a fair assessment. I mean, they're not absolutely as no-brainer no dirt cheap as they were uh, just a few months ago. But still, this is way undervalued. The sector is way undervalued. So it's like, yeah. In my opinion, perma, perma buy opportunity in good quality juniors uh, until, I mean, if you want to try to do some kind of market timing, maybe up here. Uh, but my point being that oh, there's not only gold juniors, not only silver juniors, let's say nickel, copper, it's all of them basically. So how do I make sure that I don't lose going forward? If I'm only into gold, that's going to be frustrating if this is if there is no breakout within the next few months. That's going to be frustrating. We know that. Okay, if I'm only into silver and you, we know silver is even more volatile, so it's going to, you know, uh, be more paper pain if you're wrong about that. And pr pr probably people are going to be making mistakes. I sleep like a baby 
Well, I don't really, but it, it's more to do with my uh, me thinking about stocks all the time. But I'm not uh, fr uh, scared, you know, about my portfolio at all. I have gold, silver, copper, some rare earths, nickel, zinc. I probably said silver, but it's like gold. Lithium, because if... We have a big fat crash, given that gold is at $2,000, the com uh, physical, uh, physical comics, etc., registered categories are getting grain. Gold and silver are going to moon eventually, if everything goes to shit. Okay, then the silver and gold portion of my portfolio is probably going to, I don't know how much they're going to go up, but a lot. Imagine gold going to 2.5,000 or 3,000. Yeah, those some of those juniors, even the crappy ones, are gonna go up like five hundred to a thousand percent. So I'm gonna be happy. Sure. In that case, one might have wished that ah, I wish I was only in the crappiest gold or silver juniors, whatever, because they went up one point five thousand percent. You could do that and be lucky. But if you're wrong again, and the actual fat bull is still. Uh, a year out or whatever so maybe the management teams of those companies will find a way to actually you know decrease the value substantially uh, in the meantime so i don't like that idea no i like the idea of owning a bit of everything critical minerals and precious metals because if the economy just if they're able to kick the can like they've done for such a long time uh there's going to be a shortage in copper. I mean, like you saw the short, some some believe it's going to be out by... I mean, the inventories are going to be drained by August already. That, that's just four months uh, from now. Uh, nickel is going to be a problem. Lithium is going to be a problem. Maybe cobalt is going to be a problem. Whatever. Silver is going to be a problem. Uh, thanks to, you know, uh, uh, the, the photovoltaic, the solar cells, etc. So, okay. In that case, if the global economy hampers on the gold units are still cheap so i have a margin of safety down to like 1500 dollar gold right now so they're cheap they should go up even if gold goes down 100 dollars from here or 200 or 300 dollars okay great margin of safety they're too cheap i don't care where gold is going really i know they're already pricing in a much lower gold price so no bra brainer anyway. So they'll probably do okay. I mean, they're not going to get a lot cheaper than this, or they, at least they won't stay there. So maybe I won't make much on the gold. But the nickel, lithium, and copper stocks, they might go up X hundred percent within the next few years. Okay, great. So my portfolio will probably do very well. Okay. If, if the economy crashes or we have more bank failures, whatever, it's like maybe gold and silver just go, uh, takes off to the moon. Maybe I'll lose, or, you know, lose for a while in some of these copper, nickel units. But they're, again, they are also so goddamn cheap that they're already pricing in a crashing nickel, copper price, whatever. So I'm not overpaying even if nickel and copper goes down a bit or maybe a lot even they're, st they're still pricing in no chance in hell that they're going to be a mine typically or have a mine so that's going to be a short-term paper loss because no recession lasts forever either and i didn't start off by overpaying anyway but the gold and silver portion is going to take care of it maybe you have a bit of both there become there's a problems in the uh, world economy or the banking system but the ev revolution keeps on pace copper is being consumed maybe copper goes up maybe oil goes up maybe nickel goes up maybe lithium goes up maybe silver goes up and gold goes up the thing is that's like you know sun tzu quote put yourself into a position where it's impossible to lose that's my way of seeing it because I'd rather be somewhat right, meaning that at least uh, some part of the portfolio does really well and will offset any, even even paper losses for a time. In Because again, I, I don't think anything I own really is overvalued right now. I mean, things can change. There can be negative news, etc. But right now, I think everything is cheap. So, in that scenario... One or more of these subsectors are going to do well. And hopefully I've picked pretty good companies that will do very well. 
So they're going to be offsetting the, the temporary paper losses in some other stuff. And again, maybe the nickel units go up, the copper units go up, the lithium units go up. Maybe gold units go down. Okay, so they go from dirt cheap to dirtier, cheapier. <laughs> then I could sh shuffle. Because, okay, if, if let's say the nickel, nickel, copper, and uh, lithium units get pricey. And the gold units are absolutely dirt cheap. And it's like looks like, oh, hey, gold is probably closer to a bottom. And these critical minerals or whatever, they're closer to some kind of top. I could reshuffle. So... Maybe I make, let, let's just, I'm just guessing here. Maybe I'm up 100, uh, 50 to 100 percent on my portfolio thanks to the critical minerals or whatever. Nothing to sneeze at. Okay, if you would be 100 percent in the quote right critical element or mineral, or whatever, maybe you'd be up 300 percent and would be laughing at me. Sure, it's like fine. But then I switch around, get heavier into, let's say, gold, spe specifically maybe silver. Uh, and then I get 100% from there. Whereas the ones that are still only 100% in whatever critical minerals. Maybe they are on board for a 50% tank. And I make 100% and then I double it again. Huh? So I'm up uh, 300% in that case. W while they started off being up 300% and cut that in half. So they're only up uh, 200%. Uh, 100%. I mean that, that's my. I mean this comes comes down to risk reward and game theory. I'd rather be making sure I'm gonna make money than than bet, uh, bet it all on the idea that either I'm gonna make a lot of money or I you know might go bust or or whatever or I'm gonna you know uh, suffer a fifty percent decline and it's not even it's not even you know I don't have margin of safety so there's no reason they're gonna go up again so I just s suffer a you know somewhat permanent 50% loss I don't like that idea but it's like all, all is fun because there's always idiots like this guy we all know you and your cronies could vanish off the mean twist space and not a soul besides your bank account would notice you were gone uh, my guess this guy uh, pretty bitter even though I <laughs> Had a bit of a discussion with him where he said he's obviously not bitter. I was like, just think about it. Okay, that's to this tweet. This is Robert Friedland. Me 100% in mining. Okay, I'm not 100% in mining, but that's like, yeah, again, it's like... Being mining companies, commodity, uh, commodity companies, mining companies, I mean, they're so s super cheap. And you get a billionaire saying he's, you know, uh, implying that he's 100% in mining and is cool as hell while everything else is, you know, uh, everybody else is afraid, basically, and uh, getting angry at what the Fed is going to do, etc. So th that's just, I mean, th that's just a peak of iron. That's how we know this guy has no idea what, uh, what he's doing or what he's talking about, hence why he would be bitter because he's probably a loser. I mean... There's not too many, uh, if you're a, one of those bitter bashers, there's a reason why you're a bitter basher. basher. It's not because you've been killing it. A and then, uh, uh, I was going to make some additional points. Uh, this is the one of the most diversified hodl portfolios. Uh, I help manage for a family member. Uh, it's like, yeah, again, no like nosebleed returns. But it's certainly doing its job. It's beating GDXJ, beating GDX by a mile, uh, beating uh, the stock market, etc. But sure, it's not crypto type returns, but this is a very diversified portfolio. I think that it's uh, 20 or 30 names in this. And emphasis on the more margin of safety place and probable growth place. Not too many pre discovery plays at all, really. Because I don't want to be. Most of the stories in this is like where I don't really see any story killing news release happening. Meaning it's not a bunch of one target juniors where within three months they might all be worthless. No, it's like still the largest uh, holding in this is for example Magna Mining because it has margin of safety. 
and uh, Snowland Gold is also one of those. It's like that's where this comes from. I would say it's like uh, heavy in Snowline, and then heavy in uh, Magna Mining. And as you can see, it's it's retraced with Magna Mining. And I still think Magna Mining is dirt cheap. So all I can do is hold what is dirt cheap. Uh, and, and and let's say nickel crashes or whatever. Yeah, it's gonna suck. I mean the the Magna position, e even though it might be still cheap, even with a the 10 to 20 percent decline in nickel etc because they also have a bunch of other metals but in that case i'm assuming that something terrible is well kind of terrible might have happened and the gold and silver portion of the portfolio will make it up for it that's why it's like yeah again steady state uh that that is why i on my website i have you know the hodl portfolios kind of updated because my one point is that my private portfolio can look a lot different than the hodl portfolios because i get for example unlike everyone else i can participate in uh, private placement that doesn't go for everyone so if there's a really great private placement deal i might take a big stab at a company because you get full warrants and all of that that doesn't mean that if you didn't, I mean, let's say, let's say I take a five position, five percent of my portfolio in a companies because I got it to be in, you know, with the private placement. The risk reward is so heavily skewed in my favor in that case that a five percent position might make a lot of sense. But if I didn't get the warrants, etc., maybe I would just have taken a 0.5 percent position. So it doesn't really. I think I'm doing other people a disservice, I, or let's put it like this. I think it's better that I talk about, uh, well, trying to help people get solid returns, solid long-term results, than talk too much about what I am specifically doing in my, let's say, concentrated portfolios. Because this is, I know, I mean, the family members I manage for, they uh, they are happy and should be very happy with these returns. Even though my returns in my concentrated portfolio might be a lot higher. But I take a lot more risk. I suffer uh, much more volatility, etc. So uh, it's like, the, you know, learn how to walk before you learn how to run. So I, I think that the best way of at least trying to you know help some people actually make some money in this sector is to focus on, uh, l let's say you know talk a lot about how how you make sure uh, or how how you start not losing money over time at least. Then go to I don't know technical or or go to you know. I mean, I have I, sometimes I have very, very concentrated positions, and I wouldn't tell anyone to do that because they might not be able to handle it, handle the swings, can't can't afford a loss, etc., etc. But in my opinion, which I think this shows, is that even if you have a low maintenance approach, meaning you don't do much trading at all. And you're diversified across 20 to 30 juniors with time. The market is going to turn from a voting machine to a weighing machine. So obviously this uh, portfolio has a lot of long corrections, quick corrections, deep corrections, long and deep corrections. But as time passes by and you're somewhat right on the average junior you hold being undervalued or uh, potentially becoming undervalued because you think there's a high likelihood it will keep growing in value. Uh, you're going to be up over the long term. And honestly, I think a lot of people shoot themselves in the foot by trying to get a 100% return every three months. Instead of trying to pick the cases where there's a, like a high probability that you might be up 50%, 50 to 100% over the next one to two years. It sounds boring. But if you did that, you would have Warren Buffett type returns. Because when you see people brag about one play or one quarter in their portfolio, <laughs> uh, 
typically they don't brag too long because they might have been lucky they might have taken a huge risk which made no sense but they ended up with a favorable outcome all that matters are long-term results portfolio-wide long-term results i have a lot i've had a lot of dogs i lost a lot in novo lost a lot in white rock lost quite a bit in montero bunch of other juniors that's down like i don't know 60 to 80 percent but i make up for it by typically being very heavy in the best possible risk reward scenarios made a bunch in snow line uh, i'm up quite a bit in magna and i'm still riding magna and typically Again, the better the risk reward, and you would want more, you know, safety. Uh, I mean, I've had some 30% positions. So if you have 10, 1% positions that go down, uh, uh, go down uh, 50% or 100%, or you have 20%, 0.5% positions that all get obliterated minus 100%. That one 30% position that's like by far the biggest no brainer. If that goes up 50%, that's 15% return to your overall portfolio. You you could afford to have 20 juniors go to zero positions, 0.5 positions, and you would still be uh, net plus in the portfolio. So it's like the margin of safety, is, I think, should correlate the most with position sizing. And I didn't start off doing that. I took a bunch of, I went too big. I went too big in Novo going into assay risk. I went too big in White Rock when it was still early stage, their last chance. Um, Montoro was so cheap. I thought, hey, I mean, this is just, yeah. Well, it became very cheap and I doubled down. And it's like, yeah, but didn't stop it from getting cheaper. And then the, you know, problems with the CEO, etc. cetera. It's like, yeah, I didn't foresee that because it was hadn't really anything to do with the products themselves. Uh, but you live and learn. I mean, that's the only thing. I think that I, I am getting better each year, each month, maybe even. Um, so I, exp I, I think I'm a totally different investor today than I was a, uh, two years ago. And I, th I hope it's going to just continue that way. Never stop learning, never stop thinking about things. Um, so to summarize, I would say to me, this is my personal, my two cents, uh, mining space, I've never been more comfortable. I love being uh, diversified in the sense that I have exposure to not only gold, but gold, silver, copper, nickel, lithium, um, rare earths, zinc, lead. Uh, maybe I forgot some, but yeah, who knows? Maybe dabble in some graphite or whatever. It's like. Anything you can do to keep you s yourself rational. I see it all the time when people take enormous positions in one stock. Uh, I, I remember that feeling myself. You get highly emotional. Um, it's very fun when it goes up. When it goes down, it's very easy to get pissed off and it ruins your mood and all of that. And again, like Sun Tzu said... Put yourself into a position where it's impossible to lose. I mean, I, I just don't see 30 juniors, uh, you know, going to zero spread across different metals and minerals when I think they all have potential to go up 5x or more uh, at, let's say, these prices. If the, we get a Mel bull as well, yeah, so I think some could be up. 5 to 10x or more within the next three years. But it's going to take time. I mean, if you're too excited about a story, you're typically overpaying already. Um, 
And yeah, so it's like, and, and I made a post about this, it's like how to foolproof your portfolio. You know, absolutely do not need to own the juniors I own or talk about or am sponsored by. Uh, I mean, the, the easiest way to like make sure uh, you're absolutely not making any grave mistakes is to simply diversify across companies, juniors. Uh, I mean, personally, I think the risk reward is best in juniors. You might want to take mid tiers and majors. That's just not my cup of tea. Uh, anyway, uh, to just diversify across different metals and into juniors where you have either mid tiers, majors recently taking a position or added to their position or at least some kind of recent within the six months type time frame voto conference. Uh, or you see Landines are in and you're able to buy somewhat close to where they have added or bought in or, or Pierre Lassonde or, or you know Rob McEwen or w whatever. I mean people like that because they know more than you and me. They've done all the due diligence. They've vetted the projects, the potential and they're saying hey yeah we think you have potential. And by definition if one of those juniors are trading like they have a 10% chance of finding a mine worthy of a major, let's say, then you kind of have a clue what the upside could be. Okay, if it's 10, uh, you know, 10 bagger potential. If this just one stock pe uh, is able to do what whatever investor or major thinks it could do, if you hold it long enough, maybe it goes up 10 times and it pays for 10 other juniors that went to zero or 20 juniors that went minus 50%. That is the risk reward or, or you know, probability based or shotgun approach, statistical approach I, I personally like, but you will never have one of those stories if you can't hold a stock for, I would assume at least two, three years. I mean, even the best success stories took typically three to five years to 10 bag. So if you're checking the portfolio every day or you like, oh, yes, uh, these guys made a discovery. I'm up 50%, so I'm going to take my money and walk away. Then it, you obviously don't get a 10-bagger in that because a discovery hole, for example, is just the start of something. It's going to 10-bag over the next three years. So when people like, eh, you know, I mean... I guess what I'm saying is that most people never even get the chance to have the winners pay for the losers because they sell the winners too soon. And and I mean if if they oh it's oh I'm expecting a ten bag within the next six six months. Otherwise they're gonna find another story that works or you know a pre-discovery play whatever. A anyway, long rant. Um, I hope you got something out of it. Uh, don't invest money you cannot afford to lose. Consider me biased if I talked about any juniors, I assume I own them, own them, assume I am sponsored by them, assume I'm highly biased, do your own due diligence, make form your own opinion, and for God's sake, do some self-reflection, uh, know what, how you're affected by whatever. I can't be in beta place, really, because I uh, typically end up selling it any correction because I feel like a dumbass that I bought something I know isn't really worth that much. So I st stay away from that. Uh, I'm typically a lot more comfortable like now uh, holding a basket approach to the commodities because it feels a lot better that I don't really care what way we go. If if it turns to shit, a gold and silver portion is probably going to do very well. If it doesn't go to shit, the the you know, copper, nickel, critical elements, lithium stuff is probably going to do well. And gold would do, I think, okay. Silver could even do okay, given the photovoltaic, photovoltaic demand, etc. So, okay, I feel comfortable in that. I, ca I can have a lot of exposure because I feel like I'm the hedgeless horseman is kind of hedged in a sense. Yeah, uh, thanks for listening. Hit the thumbs up button if you like this stuff. Bye.